Okay. Um, thanks for attending my talk. Um, this collaboration started with uh, when I discussed with Sioli and Daniel Genkin and Yuval uh, how we can mitigate row hammer attacks, but all in all, we just found another flip in the wall of row hammer defenses. Um, so what is Rohammer about? We already heard that in the uh, in like three talks ago. Um, it's about DRAM, and today if we look at DRAM, it's organized in channels, in banks and ranks. And if you look at one of those banks in detail, you'll find that this has uh, several rows, many rows, and uh, these are the actual capacitors in the in the rows, like 64,000 capacitors. These store the actual bits in your memory. And when you read from memory, the memory controller actually has to load the, um, load the actual bits into the row buffer that happens in the DRAM, and then it's sent to the memory controller to the CPU. There is an effect that leads to the so-called row hammer effect, uh, which is that cells leak fast upon proximate accesses, and we're going to exploit that. So if you activate those rows, after a while you will see bit flips. There are different directions that we can now go. The first is how do we do eviction? And there are a lot of papers going in different directions here. We've just seen one in an earlier talk. But there's also another direction. Uh, how do we actually hammer? And previously, there have been two techniques known. The first is we hammer one row next to a victim row and other random rows. Or we hammer two neighboring rows. And it looks like this. So if we do single-sided hammering, we just hammer a bunch of rows and expect bit flips next to one of them. In case of double-sided hammering, we are hammering two rows and we're expecting the bit flips, for instance, between those two or directly next to one of them. The question then is how to mitigate row hammer. And there have been a bunch of proposals how, how we mitigate row hammer attacks. For instance, detecting row hammer attacks via performance counters, because they have way more cache misses and cache hits uh, than other attacks uh, or, or other benign workloads also. So we can probably single them out. The other idea was, uh, another idea was to detect them before they actually happen, for instance, using static analyzers on the binary and finding that uh, there is such attack codes. There is, an, of course, an open problem, the false positives, but we will see another problem in a, in a minute. There have been software-based defenses like Anvil. I'm just picking a few here. Anvil uses performance counters to detect, uh, to detect which rows are hammered and then refreshes uh, the neighboring rows. This also is available in hardware. Uh, in, in a similar variant, then it's called target row refresh. Um, there was at Usenix last year, BCAT and GCAT, and there the idea is to either disable the vulnerable physical memory locations or to isolate them, so to place some barrier, physical barrier, between the uh, different security domains. In that paper, it was just kernel and user space, but in general, you could uh, do that with more security domains, of course. So if we uh, put the, the, all of that together in a table, we see that um, we um, have a lot of defenses that um, use performance counters. We have a lot of hardware modifications. I didn't discuss them, and we will also not focus on them because most of them are not applied yet on, on current systems. And a few other static analyzers, physical proximity, memory footprint. Um, so also the memory access pattern plays a role here. And the question, one of the core questions uh, when we started was, do you actually have to hammer multiple memory locations? And that brought us to one location hammering. Actually, there are at least three different hammering techniques because we propose a third one. And there you only hammer one row and expect bit flips right next to it. Works like this. You hammer it, you activate it, it's deactivated, you activate it again, it's deactivated, you activate it, and after a while you see bit flips next to it. Why does this work? Because we heard in the, in the previous talk that there was a system which used open page policy, probably. The idea there is that you keep the row open and buffered, and then you have a low latency for subsequent accesses to the same row, but a high latency for accesses to any other row, but there are thousands of different rows, so this is good if you're pretty sure that you're going to access the same row again. More efficient if you're expecting that the next access goes to a different row is the closed page policy. There you immediately close a row and are ready to open a new row, so you have a 
medium latency for accesses to any row, including your, the, the, the row that you have just opened before. So it's just a trade-off in this case. Um, it, it has been found that these perform better on multi-core systems because there you have the memory accesses from different cores and usually they are not so much related to each other. If we look at the bit flip distribution on a four kilobyte page, uh, you can see that most of the bit offsets are covered, so we ran this test only for eight hours, but basically you can reach any, four bit, any bit offset on a four kilobyte page with double-sided or single-sided hammering. With one location hammering, the number of bit flips is just lower. That's why we only have 36% uh, uh, um, of the bit offset covered after eight hours. The distribution of zero to one flips and one to zero flips is approximately the same for all methods. So next question is how do we exploit random bit flips? And we already heard that in the previous talk, they are not actually random. They are highly reproducible. Once you have a bit flip uh, from some memory hammering pattern, you can reproduce it. So the strategy is always the same. You choose a data structure that you can place at an arbitrary memory location. Then you scan for good bit flips and then you place the data structure there. Then you trigger the bit flip again, and then you have your bit flip in the right location. Previous defenses suggested that you could just uh, make the kernel out of reach, right, like uh, the GCAT countermeasure. For that, we came up with some technique called opcode flipping. And with opcode flipping, we um, found that many applications on your system run as root. For instance, pseudo runs as root. Because they have to do some operation that unprivileged users cannot, but unprivileged users can use those applications. Uh, for instance, ping and mount also. We target pseudo because it's easy to exploit. It's straightforward. If there's something wrong in pseudo, then we might be root. And to illustrate what happened, happens or might happen in the pseudo binary, we will look at a jump equal instruction. And if we flip a bit in a jump equal instruction, it will change the semantics of the program. And if the right bit flips, it changes the semantics in a way that you can directly bypass the password check. This is quite unfortunate. Um, let's see whether we can actually have a bit flip in exactly that location. Um, first, um, we don't need to target exactly that location. We can have a bit flip somewhere else in a binary as well. Um, for instance, comparisons, addresses of memory loads and stores, address calculations. There are loads of different opportunities, what you can flip. In a manual analysis, we found 29 possible bit flip offsets, but uh, we think that we should automate this search for possible bit flip offsets, but we haven't done that yet. All of these bit flips somehow skip the password check, so somehow we can uh, become root without knowing the password. The question now is, sudo, well, it's a binary, right? How do we get the target virtual page from this binary to the target physical location where we can induce the right bit flip? And for that, we uh, introduce a technique called memory waylaying. Um, the idea is quite straightforward. Basically, we want to maneuver a target binary page to a vulnerable physical page. And it's not as easy as with page tables or other pages that we can spray over the entire memory because binaries are only once in memory. They are kept in the page cache. Once they are in the page cache, they will stay there. Even after the program terminates, the page will still be there. So when is it evicted? Only if the page cache is full. Only if the entire memory is full and the page cache has to remove one page to load one more page into the memory. The page cache usually occupies all the unused memory, so we would have to occupy, occupy all memory to throw out our page. However, instead, we can also just uh, move the victim page to a target page by occupying the memory with other page cache pages. So we are evicting the page cache by filling it with other page cache pages. With that, we can evict the victim binary. And we can use MinCore, that's a quite convenient system call for that, uh, to check whether the victim page was evicted. 
So we just fit, load more binary pages into the system, uh, into the DRAM, until our victim page was evicted, and then we reload the victim and uh, see that it has a new physical page. We continue the, with this until it's on the target page, and then we can induce our bit flip there. So just to illustrate this a bit, uh, we start with maybe a memory layout like this. The blue parts are occupied, the white parts are free, and the gray parts are occupied by the page cache. Our binary page is marked as green with a B, and our target page is the X. And then we evict the page cache, so our binary page is gone. We reload it, we repeat this again and again, until it's located at the right offset. How well does this work? Well, it's, first of all, system dependent. It depends on where the operating system, uh, which pages the operating system assigns to your new page. On a default Ubuntu setup, we got this, so most of the physical memory was uh, covered with that. So we were able to maneuver our um, page to virtually any physical memory location. The great advantage over just uh, evicting the memory with a large array, with occupying just uh, memory with our own data, is that we have a very negligible memory footprint. Um, as you can see, the memory footprint stays very, very low because the page cache pages are not considered our pages. They are just system pages, right? And now the third step that we introduce is we combine Rowhammer with SGX, and we get two things out of, out of that. The first is cheap denial of service. Um, SGX uh, is an instruction set in extension, and it provides integrity and confidentiality for code and data in untrusted environments. You can run it as a regular user program, but you cannot perform certain things so that you're not, a, not able to implement malware in it, right? Um, the enclaves use a dedicated memory area in the physical memory, the EPC region, and this is integrity checked and encrypted. What, so the question then is, what happens if a bit flips in this integrity checked region, right? And of course, the integrity check will fail. What will happen next? <laughs> we lock up the entire memory controller, which is not a good idea, right? Because no further memory goes through the memory controller. Um, the system halts immediately. I don't know, think of backing up some stuff before halting the entire system. Yes, uh, sounds unsafe. It is unsafe. You will lose data if that happens. And we, we were able to trigger that. Actually, the first attacks we, attack implementations we had uh, triggered that by accident. We were not intending to trigger this in the beginning. Quite annoying if your system halts all the time. So the next thing uh, is, um, what if, we happen, what if this happens in the cloud, right? If a malicious enclave does that in the cloud, for instance, Microsoft now has, an, has, an, uh, has a cloud that uh, allows you to use SGX. If we trigger that in the cloud, the entire machine halts, including the co-located tenants. So this is cheap denial of service attacks in the cloud, and you can do that again and again every time the system is booted up again. The other option that we can do is we can combine SGX with one location hammering and opcode flipping and build an undetectable row hammer exploit. Because SGX protects software from malicious environments, it also protects it from some uh, attacks like performance counter-based attacks. Most performance counters do not work on SGX enclaves. They are just not included in, um, in, in the performance counters. And this defeats quite a lot of countermeasures uh, that rely on uh, performance counters. Putting it all together, we can see that static analysis uh, performance counters are both defeated by using Intel SGX. One location hammering uh, destroys previous assumptions about the memory access patterns. Opcode flipping works around the physical proximity issue, and memory waylaying uh, solves the problem that you have to acquire a lot of memory and by that bring your system close to out of memory situations. And by that, we have defeated all the different defense classes. With that, I will get to the conclusion. And the conclusion is, it's easy to break previous assumptions. And that this is possible shows that we have an incomplete understanding of the attacks. We first need to get a compl more complete understanding of the attack before we are able to 
design complete countermeasures. The current countermeasures were only patches against specific exploit. They were not really solutions to the underlying problems. And uh, as we heard in the previous talk already, it's quite difficult to solve the problem because in the end, it's an optimization problem. On the one side, you want to optimize for performance. On the other side, you want to uh, not have Rohammer bit flips. The problem is that the attacker becomes more and more powerful. So attacks that were once not possible because the boundary was chosen wisely might become possible in the near future. And also, new features might introduce new attack vectors, especially the combination of SGX and Rohammer here um, allows to change the nature of the attack quite a bit. Thanks for your attention, and I'm looking forward to discussion. All right, amazing work, Daniel. Uh, again, uh, questions, please approach one of the mics and uh, state your name and affiliation. Don't all run at once, though, because we don't want to flip any bits. Um, okay, go I'm ahead. Young, Young Jun Jang from Oregon State University. So the, I have seen the, some of the differences uh, based on the, the performance counter and then the, by design, Intel SGX prohibited like a reading up the direct value. But there is a side channel tag on like uh, we can get some of the performance counter unit value for, from the uncore performance monitor. And then by subtracting some of the values, then we can indirectly know about the, what SGX has performed. And uh, did, you, uh, did you have uh, any concern on the, like, that kind of the the things could uh, re uh, reveal, uh, uh, let the defenders can exploit that features? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, actually, we looked at quite a lot of performance counters, uh, something like uh, 40 to 50 different performance counters, and including also the Uncore, for instance, the CBO uh, cache uh, events. Um, and I'm sure there are performance counters which would work uh, and which could be used to detect this attack, um, but we haven't found any. But probably there are. There's an abundance of performance counters. Um, yeah. um, I'm not sure whether this is the right way to solve this problem, because you can induce bit flips quite, uh, quite quickly in a, in a small amount of time. And uh, also, our assumptions uh, that uh, Rohammer uh, is a, is a, so the, the attacks that we've seen today are still sort of local attacks, right? Because they have local code execution. But there is an upcoming ViewSec paper that shows that you can do Rohammer attacks over network. Thank you. Yes, Matt. Matthew Hicks, Virginia Tech. So yeah, you mentioned the, the upcoming uh, you know, packet-based, uh, network-based. Rohammer attack we saw earlier, you can have, sorry, <laughs> system on chip, uh, kind of GPU-based, other, you know, Rohammer attacks. You see in this work a very systematic destruction of existing defenses. So where are you, and you said, I want to start out doing defenses. Where is your current mindset, your group's mindset on defenses now? Does it have to be hardware? Is there any hope for software? Where are you at on that? It's quite difficult um, because uh, I, I think we need um, a solution that is uh, also backed by hardware mechanisms. Um, a pure software solution probably would not work against the Rohammer problem. Then this challenge of deployability comes into play. What about all the systems that exist? How can we provide protection? Do you see a way forward and? for existing deploy systems? Luckily, uh, many systems seem unaffected, uh, where many is something between 30 and 70%, because we don't have any good prevalence studies on Rohammer. Um, but most systems are probably unaffected, especially by the more exotic variants like Rohammer and JavaScript. Uh, I'm not sure about the, uh, the GPU variant because I haven't looked at the details. Uh, probably this one is a bit more realistic, but the, for Rohammer JS, your system has to be really, really uh, susceptible for, for Rohammer bit flips from JavaScript on a, from, using the CPU cache eviction. Uh, probably with the GPU, it works a bit better. 
um, for, um, in, in, in general, um, like the, the uh, throw hammer attack, that also requires um, uh, RDMA. Most systems today don't have RDMA. So I would expect that most systems today are not immediate uh, attack targets, um, not that much high on the, on, the, on the target list of an attacker. Also because we have more easy uh, vectors to get into a system, right? Okay, we got two final questions. Uh, Ruby? So, um, nice work. Now, SGX didn't have in its threat model either side channels or denial of service attacks. But of course, if the side channel does threaten uh, loss of confidentiality or integrity, which is what SGX is trying to protect against, then that would be serious. But I guess um, all you showed was a denial of service attack, which is interesting, but you didn't get any loss of confidentiality or integrity, right? So for the first attack, we had a denial of service attack, but the second one where we combine it with opcode flipping and memory waylaying, um, and uh, for, for this variant, we, um, we actually compromise the system. The, the integrity. The yeah. integrity, so basically we, we compromise the, the system. We can take full control of the system, not over the SGX part. This will still be protected. Yeah. Um, the key point that we try to make here is that uh, if you build SGX in a very clever way so that you cannot spy on benign applications, you also won't be able to spy on our Rowhammer enclave. So SGX then also protects our malware. Right. I thought your last comment that we really must understand the attacks mm -hmm. better before we can have the countermeasures. I was wondering, can you articulate the fundamental problem in hardware that causes these throw hammer-like attacks? I think the, the, the problem that uh, exists in hardware um, is known to the DRAM vendors for quite a while now. No, no, um, not DRAM, I mean broader than DRAM. It's, it's, what is the fundamental big class of problems that causes these hardware side channel attacks. Yeah, in general, we always have a trade-off between optimization, uh, in optimization between performance and security. And the problem in, in uh, IT security uh, is that we, uh, that we don't optimize towards a physical uh, boundary to a, towards a physical law that exists that prevents us from optimizing further, but we're optimizing with I hope so, with security in mind. And the problem now is that the adversary doesn't stick to its boundary that we intended for, uh, for, to exist, or that, that we thought to uh, believe to exist. The adversary pushes the boundary more towards us and changes what it, what it is allowed to do so our previous assumptions about what the adversary can do might be wrong over time. And I think that's a problem. We need uh, security mechanisms that, um, that we can, at a later point, adapt so that we can cope with a stronger adversary later on. And so as we go to the last question, I'll just also answer that. There's actually a workshop that will be happening this summer uh, with position papers due on June 1, just one page position papers if you search for the uh, CCC Embedded Security Workshop, not the Chaos Computer Club, yeah. but a different CCC, uh, the Embedded Security Workshop. Uh, a lot of these fundamental questions will be discussed. Uh, our final question. Yes, so Alex Gantman from Qualcomm. So I couldn't resist since you set it up so well, Daniel, but um, your point about needing to you know, develop proper long-term mitigations based on real understanding of attacks. So do you feel that the current um, uh, disclosure practices adequately incentivize uh, proper development of countermeasures over immediate short-term fixes? It's difficult to tell. I think currently there's a lot of things changing, um, but in general, I think in, we, we've seen it in other areas. Uh, bug bounty programs solve a lot of problems, but, or solve, uh, reduce the number of bugs in products, 
but um, I'm not sure that they necessarily um, improve the software quality on a long run. So the question is whether we are going the right direction here in hardware security. It's difficult to predict the future, right? All right. Uh, thank you, Dan. Now we have one. Uh, oh, thanks first. <laughs>